MIT, Boston, uh, from class of 2011, uh, EZS branch. I love solving problems. Uh, as a kid, the uh, math problems, and now probably got a crisis. So when I was a kid, I uh, I used to see the star movies, for example, and I used to see those kids drinking from uh, tap water, and I used to think, what uh, what's wrong with these kids? How can they drink water from tap water? They don't have a filter. Or what's wrong with them? Later on, when I grew up, I realized that uh, they are really clean water, and we don't. And it's probably been 15 years from then, and we still don't have that kind of water facility in India, which is quite sad, frankly speaking. So today, uh, I'm here to discuss about uh, water issues in India and how we are trying to solve it. I'll divide this into four sections, the problem that exists and what exactly is it the, that we are trying to solve, the reason for it to exist and why haven't anyone else solved it before, the solution that we have and uh, the need for doing this. And why, why don't we make an internet firm instead of doing something like this? So let's start with the problem and why is it this bad? So the uh, first category of people uh, who we are trying to reach is the kind of people who don't have access to pipe water itself. So uh, we, take, we take water for granted. Uh, developed countries take uh, pure water for granted. But there's a very large section of India, as much as one third of, uh, two third of rural population who don't have access to water. They have to go to regular ponds or river which is not very clean and uh, which obviously uh, causes diseases. There's a lot of mineral issues and uh, you have to walk a long distance to uh, get that water. So a lot of times those are students, uh, children. Instead of going to school, they basically try to get water, which isn't very cool. This results in a lot of deaths. A lot of children die out of dehydration because of minerals. Out of diarrhea is a very curable disease, but a lot of people get it because of waterborne diseases, which is a big problem. But even beyond that, even uh, people like us who have piped water, we also have a problem. Uh, most of our, if you've ever been to IIT Bombay, there's a pipeline that goes right next to the boys' hostel. So uh, if you go there, you can see a lot of cracks on it. There's a lot of sewage water that uh, seeps into the drinking water. And this is not a rare issue. This is a very big problem. In February this year, uh, Noida, uh, in Noida, there were about 3,000 families who suddenly f fell in within a week, including children. This was because apparently their uh, drinking water was being mixed by sewage water and they were forced to drink it for a month. So that is a big problem. Even though we've spent so much money on this kind of issues, this has been existent for many decades now, which is quite shameful. The third category of people that we are uh, focusing on is the drought affected areas in Maharashtra, in Latur area, in Andhra. So uh, this is the primary uh, go-to area where we want to start. Because they have a, uh, Latur for example doesn't have pipe, uh, it has pipe but it does not have water. That is such a big problem. 29% of, uh, of the reservoirs don't have water. Uh, so that is a big problem. Uh, yeah. Right. So uh, the reason uh, for this is uh, basically this management. Delhi has Yamuna and stuff. So uh, this is there. So this is the availability of water. Uh, India is very low in the availability. After uh, independence, we, uh, we gave free electricity to uh, the farmers. They started uh, depleting the groundwater in, uh, very quickly. So uh, unlike uh, other countries, this has gone down and this is going down very rapidly, which is a bad situation. If we don't have enough water per capita, then uh, obviously uh, it's not a good situation to be in. The, uh, uh, in India, there's only two cities which has 24-7 water supply. Others, of the, we know the, we don't get 24-7, we have only a few hours. In Delhi, for example, you have places in Delhi get only for three hours a day. So uh, we would like to see uh, water being uh, available 24-7 of, of the time. The another main reason is industrialization and farming. In Delhi, for example, uh, we get a lot of uh, water from Yamuna, which is basically black and really uh, you can't drink in it. We have another source, Panipat, the river that comes through Panipat. Unfortunately, uh, there's a dye uh, industry, there's a, a lot of clothing industry in Panipat, and they uh, often uh, put dye, uh, discharge dye into the water. And that renders the uh, drinking supply of Delhi non-existent. So that is a big problem. 
so as you can see uh, the irrigation takes a lot of water second area second problem is thermal power stations they use a lot of water and uh, usually they don't have a meter so what they end up doing is they use a lot of water unnecessarily and this reduces the available water that uh, consumers would have so we need to uh, change that also the uh, we ourselves are problem we dump a uh, lot of uh, dirt in the water uh, the dead bodies are prohibited and still we uh, look for area other means to uh, dump those then another problem is mafia for example in delhi we pay at least 2x the price just for daily use of water because we don't get water we have to go to these tankers or uh, any other people now these people they go in the night and they uh, use either dams or uh, well or whatever it be and they uh, take water out from there and sell it in the daytime this also destroys the ground ground water so uh, that is a bad idea if you have enough water then we can probably uh, do a better job of controlling the mafia so there are enough uh, solutions uh, we could desalinize we can use desalinization plants like israel is the biggest one there's one coming up in california where we take uh, sea water and remove salt out of it but that has a problem uh, it uses a lot of energy to do that and uh, it uses a lot of electricity so that's a bad idea you can't produce a lot of water that day and the biggest challenge is not every place in the world has a sea water access so uh, you need to solve that like for example delhi uh, would will not have uh, will not be able to solve that so uh, this is where we come uh, where we solve this exact problem so uh, we generate water, we produce water using processes that has zero emissions we do not use electricity from the grid for example or we do not burn fossil fuels so it is a completely zero emission process uh, it is inexpensive we uh, we can be uh, as cheap as the tap water we don't have to be very expensive uh, like bisleri or uh, any of that if you go to latur you have a lot of these bisleri uh, bottles you will see all around so these are from uh, second uh, secondary market basically they refill those bottles and sell so that is a bad idea we can generate at very high volumes uh, and uh, it is reliable and closer to the uh, people who go uh, to the consumers so uh, it uh, reduces contamination and it reduces the infrastructure cost that needs to be there and it is safer so this is how we make it we have an engine basically and this is how it operates <laughs> so uh, the uh, this is basically how it does so um, in this the engine that you just saw is our uh, engine that we use we use low grade heat from uh, sources like thermal power plants uh, hot water or from a restaurant exhaust or even vehicles exhaust for that matter and uh, we have a thermo a special thermodynamic cycle which is sort of similar to rankin cycle and it produces electricity generally we can uh, basically run the turbine which produces electricity in a different mode of operation we can produce less electricity and uh, the by product of the process of this whole thermodynamic process is water so we can change the whole uh, dynamics and produce more water and less almost negligible electricity we had started this as a rural electrification program so uh, but uh, this is one mode of operation the another by product is cooled air so if this is in rural area for example we can connect this to a silo and produce cold storage systems so uh, at very cheap rates and uh, this is the turbine uh, the rocket that is required to do this is so uh, if you see this is the water being produced this does not have a canister turbines have uh, perfect casings Uh, in uh, some microns distance, so that would produce a lot of water, and a lot of water is being sp uh, spent on the uh, in, into the atmosphere. So this would produce a lot more water than we can see right now. And uh, this is the energy consumption. Generally, you spend a lot of energy to generate or to produce water if it's not from a fresh water system like a lake or a river or whatever it may be. We uh, we consume very less amount of uh, energy. we can even use solar power we can just connect uh, four solar panels for example and generate water so there is no uh, cost of uh, energy we don't need a source of uh, water also like lakes or anything since we use uh, humidity from air to generate water uh, we co uh, we cool it down and use the liquid 
delicacy materials to uh, pull water out of it. So uh, this is there, and they are also uh, very cheap uh, to generate water since we do not require. Uh, uh, we are not dependent on other uh, quantities. We do not have logistics. We do not have uh, energy considerations, and we don't need a continuous supply of water. So that makes us very in, uh, inexpensive. We do not need uh, like at MIT. There has been research for artificial photosynthesis that uses rutherium core. Uh, rutherium is very expensive uh, beyond large scale. That's not very possible. So we don't use the, we use pure aluminium to build our engines. So that basically makes it cheap. It has a long lifeline of 20 plus years. So uh, maintenance is cheap and uh, it, uh, in the longer run it comes to be cheaper than tap water. And why are we doing this? Uh, is, uh, there's a Japanese concept called Ikigai, uh, which means uh, everyone comes on earth for a certain purpose. And we think this is our purpose to solve the bigger paper problems that the uh, people on earth face. And uh, probably your Ikigai is to help people like us do something that we want. Uh, questions. So uh, we started out as an uh, energy company where we generate electricity. So how we see ourselves is as per kilowatt hours, uh, which are capacity. Uh, so we can generate as much as 20,000 liters on our prototype right now per day. Uh, but uh, as with DG sets, you see DG sets in your home and on uh, multi megawatt levels. So we can upgrade them depending on the need. So uh, we, we are not in a home or offices, uh, probably a little over that. And we can go right up to the plant level where the RM is to uh, generate water for villages or communities, uh, but not for whom. Uh, that would be very expensive for us. Yeah, but, uh, so far, it was electricity. If uh, we can choose to uh, generate almost no electricity and instead focus it on only water generation. So, uh, the electricity, how it works is basically we have an engine. And uh, that engine, uh, it takes low grade energy from uh, whatever source it is. And it converts that into power, electricity. So the byproduct of this, uh, it uses air as a heat exchange fluid uh, in the engine. So, uh, uh, and air has water in it, humidity. So another byproduct, we cool it so much at minus 55 degrees that water comes out. So uh, we want, that is a parasitic loss. We don't want that happening when you're generating electricity. But what we can do is instead of generating electricity, we can cool it down to minus 55 degrees, which generates water. So, so far we've generated 20,000 liters uh, okay. per day. So the, this is like, uh, we were just testing it. And this is not the final product. We know we can generate much more than that. The only uh, condition is we need to check the uh, mass flow rate of air. So the, the production depends only on the mass flow, uh, mass flow of air. And uh, like DG sets, we can scale it up. So that shouldn't be much of a problem. Scaling down might be a problem. We wouldn't want to produce uh, water for one home. So What's the operating cost like to generate uh, Right now, uh, for a month, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been spending about 2,000 rupees uh, during the whole month. For operating, we use solar. There's nothing else that we uh, require. So uh, the 2,000 rupees is basically uh, the working fuel that we have to buy and the solar truck. One meter square. Uh, we build this for uh, 40,000 rupees. Uh, for uh, if we have a production of uh, more than 100 uh, engines, then we can definitely uh, produce it at about 30,000 or less. So 40,000 rupees invested in uh, 20,000 liters per day. Yes. Okay. This is distillation grade water. So we don't have any microbes in it. We don't have mineral issues that water generally has. Uh, this is pure water, basically. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, yeah. One is, what is the humidity range you can operate? Right. Like air. Right. Is the air, is it free air or is it compressed? Right. Uh, and 
the vacuum tube. So uh, the air is called uh, the regular atmospheric air. We don't process it, we don't do anything to it. And uh, we can, uh, theoretically, uh, we can go for as much as 10% humidity. Uh, because we are uh, going to minus 55, we basically uh, produce ice and not just water. So uh, the humidity shouldn't be so much of a problem. Uh, even in, for example, in Sub-Saharan in Africa, there's a company which uses a deliquescent material and uh, the billboards that you see on the roads, they, uh, they have a meter uh, uh, long uh, tube full of, full of that material and that produces water enough for those villages there. So uh, we are pretty much doing the uh, same thing, uh, but we are doing it at the minus 55 degrees. So if they can uh, give water to a village using that, we are sure we can do much better uh, at whatever the humidity level uh, is there. So uh, that shouldn't be a problem. If we were at say 4 degrees or 5 degrees, then we would probably worry about the humidity. But at minus 55, uh, humidity should not be a problem. And if you have a humidity level that low that uh, we can't uh, take it out, then that would, uh, we can't survive in that kind of environment either. So we wouldn't probably be working in that kind of situation anyway. So uh, yeah, let me just. Okay, so basically we use low grade, uh, so how Rankin cycle works is basically you have a working fluid, like water, and you uh, give it heat, and uh, wherever it, uh, it converts into gas, superheated steam, that gas then drives the turbine. So similarly, we have a working fluid, which is a proprietary uh, fluid, uh, which is, does not have carbon in it, and uh, so we heat it with low grade heat. Uh, anything that is above uh, two degrees Celsius, but uh, below 130 degrees Celsius. So uh, this then uh, superheats our gas. The, uh, the characteristic of a working fluid is that its coefficient of heat uh, expansion is a function of temperature. So if you increase the temperature, not only would it increase in volume, it would, the rate of uh, expansion itself would increase. So, the increase. so that's uh, pretty much an explosion. We use this property at 130 degree to, uh, to go from 8 to PSI directly to 2800 PSI. And this then uh, runs our turbine, the one that you just saw. And this is, uh, this, this is a turbo generator. So there's a generator directly connected to it, which generates electricity. Uh, once the, the spent working fluid, the, so in Rankin cycle, the biggest issue that anyone ever has is what do you do with the spent steam? So either you let it go into the atmosphere, which is uh, spent water. Now you need continuous flow of water, which is expensive. Or you can regenerate it by cooling it. Now for cooling it, you have to bring down the temperature and compress it. And compressing any gas is a very uh, stupid thermodynamic process because there's a lot of heat that goes out, which you cannot use. So uh, there's as much as 60 to 80 percent parasitic loss just because of that in today's thermo uh, thermal power plant. So instead of mechanically compressing it, we use electro electrocatalysts. So which basically uses electricity uh, at about two volts with catalysts uh, to convert uh, the spent working fluid back into the liquid. Obviously, it takes energy, but it's much, much lesser than mechanical compression. So uh, this, I think, you'll probably understand being a chemical engineer. So this is a continuous process. So uh, this is what we're employing, and this is one of our uh, key uh, property. What is the stage you are at now? So, uh, yes, we have uh, three prototypes ready. Uh, we are making our fourth one right now. Not yet, uh, so, but we are working, uh, we are also working with Indus towers, uh, telecom towers to power the telecom towers. Yes, sir, for at least yeah. some, uh, area, we do the solar water heater. Right. So, uh, we haven't tried the solar yet, uh, we just started, that 2000, uh, 20,000 uh, was from solar. We are also, so our factory that uh, we have, we are also trying to use heat recovery there. So, they have a very small furnace, so uh, we probably would want to try that. So the fourth prototype that we are building is going to be uh, using heat recovery. And we are also in talks with the, uh, the Indupras power plants. So they have uh, big uh, gas turbines in Delhi. So, uh, so we can also, since they don't have access to uh, natu natural gas, they've been operating at uh, one-sixth of their uh, operation capacity. So they're sort of interested in their uh, solar division. So we are in talks with them since a month and a half now. Yes. Uh, 
the base chemical that we start is uh, very widely used uh, chemical in the chemical in the chemical petroleum industry so uh, it's basically uh, so it's basically a nitrogen based compound that we have but you make it or you buy it we uh, buy it and then we enrich it into a, yeah no, there, there's no import. Even India generates the basic. It's not the same model. Uh, the only thing is they use a simple delic deliquescent material. And uh, so far, they've just uh, tried it in a few villages. 